Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> you know, if I was a lot younger, I could get back there quicker and get up here quicker and learn that sound thing and then make the noise that it just made. So, But we could hear the bell even without the speakers. I thought that was really good. So one uh, announcement is we will be singing freely, freely during the offering instead of give thanks. So that's one change. And I am so excited that you guys are here to worship with us. And maybe I should have said something after Pastor left, but as if you ever Google anything, sometimes God just takes you to a certain page, and sometimes you don't get to that page. But as I was uh, doing some searching last night, and, and we are going through a transition with, without a pastor. And so, the, so I found some little snippets here. It's common knowledge that pastors often move on and studies actually validate this point. According to one survey conducted by Lifeway Research, the average tenure for a full-time pastor is six years, which what pastor made it, he was like five, right? This frequency of change may sound alarming, but when you take into consideration that the average employee tenure is 4.6 years, pastors aren't doing so bad after all. I was like, 4.6? That's like, I've been with the company for 33 years. And <laughs> they probably wanted to get rid of me after four. <laughs> and then I was, later on in the article, it said, uh, maybe you should change leadership if, you, if your pastor leaves. I didn't say that. I just made that up. But, <laughs> but <laughs> the thought has crossed my mind. <laughs> According to pastoral succession expert William Vander Bloman, it takes the average church 12 to 24 months to find a new pastor. So, hey, we're just right in it. We're only three months in. <laughs> so that's why you should be excited today because a pastor is coming. It just might take a while. There's one reality you must embrace during a pastoral transition. The life of your church marches on. There's nobody more sad than, than myself that pastor has taken another call. For a variety of reasons, it's difficult when a pastor takes another call, but the life of your church is not limited to this one man. Your church is made up of every member who places their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's everybody here as part of the church. Our praise team's still singing. We're still, Wayne's helping us lead worship. Our youth is still there we're still going to be fine. This is what the Apostle Paul emphasizes in his letter to the church in Corinth. For just as the body is one as many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. That's from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 14. And this is why I'm so excited, because Jesus is alive. Jesus is in control. Jesus loves this church, his church. God is involved in our situation. God will work things out. God has good plans for us, this church. Wayne, if you'll lead us in worship. Tracy, you are just getting started, and if you'd have delayed that for a little bit farther down the program, I wouldn't have had a message to give. <laughs> Keep going, man. Keep going. Well, we'll begin with prayer. Join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you would care for your church, for us. And we trust you, Lord, uh, as you have brought us this far, that you will take us farther according to your purpose. And now as we gather together here today, we pray that you would be among us, your spirit would, would lead us as we sing, as we uh, pray, as we hear your word, as we hear it proclaimed. May it be your service, and may we be in, totally enriched by it. And so we pray these things as we begin, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.
welcome to church this morning. It's a beautiful day. The harvest is bountiful. We have much to be thankful for. So if you would like to rise and sing with us as we sing, You Are My King. Join me in the confession of sins on page two. Almighty God, 
Our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Isaiah chapter 30. The Lord longs to be gracious to you, therefore he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. The Old Testament is from Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering to the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone, any who found him should attack him. The epistle lesson is from Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 and 16 through 8. 18. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the readings. Will you please rise for the reading of the gospel in Luke 18, 9 through 17. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. 
But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. When the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called, to, called them to him, saying, let the, little, or let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Let us continue with, by confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with the song before the throne of God above.
Heavenly Father, again, we pray that you would be with us as we delve into your word, that your word may become meaningful to each one of us as we endeavor to carry out your plans for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our sermon text this morning is only a portion, at least primarily, of our gospel for the day, and that's the last part. Um, You know, when Pastor Meyer was here, he had this rule of three, he called it, and that was if he saw something, heard something, read something, and it had kind of the same point three times, he thought, God's talking to me. And I better pay attention and carry out whatever that purpose was. So he had the rule of three, which, I don't know, I guess that's not a bad idea. Probably, as soon as you find out, carry out God's will, if possible. But this last part of our gospel for the day is recorded in three gospels. So I thought, well, this must be the important part. And we're going to delve on that today. Not that the first verses aren't important, we will touch on those, but uh, the last part I'm really going to think about. And it starts out with the little children. And as I mentioned, it's in three Gospels. It's Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. So I tried to combine those three readings and, and make sure we got the whole picture, if I could. So we'll see how this goes. I'm going to read it again, starting at verse 15. Luke says, Now they were bringing even infants, now Matthew and Mark call them children, to him that he might touch them, and Matthew adds, and pray. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them, that is, the people who brought the children. But Jesus, Mark adds this this phrase, was indignant called them to him, saying, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And Mark calls it the kingdom of heaven. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And Matthew adds, And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And Mark said, He laid his hands on them, and he went away, which I thought was a peculiar ending to that, and he went away. Okay, I don't know where he went. Not important today. Matthew and Mark, this teaching follows one on marriage and possessions. In Luke, as we see, it follows the uh, parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector, Pharisee and a tax collector are at opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to Jewish society. One was so very highly regarded, and the other was not, we'll say. But they also had opposite ends of the spectrum when it came to trust. The Pharisee, as we see here, trusted in himself. I thank God I'm not like other men, whereas the the publican or tax collector trusted in God. But on to the little children. There are some positive elephants in the the account. They brought the children to Jesus. That's a good thing. He touched them. He took them in his arms. He blessed them. That's a good thing. And then we know that he prayed for them. Wouldn't that have been awesome to have him there praying for you? Which he has. But They heard words from God himself. They heard words from God himself. And then also, the really good thing is there's a promise of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God contained right there. Now, there are some negatives too, unfortunately. The disciples, that was Jesus' followers, 
the disciples rebuked them, stopping the flow of children to the Savior's arms. Now, they may have had some what they thought were valid reasons for that. You know, they don't think they just did it willy-nilly. Maybe they felt like Jesus' time was too valuable to spend with babies. He was too important of a figure to spend that time there. And perhaps they wanted to preserve that time so they could hear teaching from him and not be taken up by the others. This is fairly late in Jesus' earthly ministry, and so they may have sensed or finally caught on that the time was growing short and they needed to absorb all they could. That's a possibility. More likely, they thought, what a waste of time. They're just kids. They don't understand this. They're babies. They don't get it anyway. And there was also a thought that perhaps these People were bringing these children out of act of superstition, that Jesus had a magic touch of some sort. Now, if that was their motive, I'm confident that Jesus would have put a halt to the whole thing. He knows hearts, and if they were there out of superstition, I would submit that he would have stopped that whole procession. So I don't think they were doing this out of superstition, but there is some thought that that was the disciples' fear. The scene. Now, this this scene kind of might upset your predetermined notion of this. It did mine. I guess I've seen too much artwork where you see Jesus sitting, either standing in a pasture or sitting on a stone or something, and kids are coming to him, and he's picking them up in this beautiful, idyllic scenery behind him. I guess that's just because the artist liked scenery. I don't know, maybe. I don't know. It doesn't say that. But in Mark 10, 10, it says, uh, and in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. Now, this matter was the divorce thing that I talked about. Mark precedes this, this event. But it's in a house. You ever put him there? I hadn't. But it makes some sense when they say this stream of kids coming in, and all of a sudden it stopped. I can just envision the disciples uh, standing in the doorway, saying, all right, that's enough. He doesn't need to be bothered with you. You know, crowd control. And so I think maybe that seems more more likely. And then he looked outside, and uh, Jesus did, and he looked out, and he said, hey, what's going on here? Why the stoppage? And he sees his disciples doing this, and he becomes indignant. Now, maybe you have a handle on indignant, but here's what I looked it up. I always make sure I'm talking about, contrary to popular belief. Um, Indignant is feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what is perceived as unfair treatment. And I tried to figure out if Jesus was really angered there or annoyed, but either way, He saw unfair treatment. So these kids were being deprived of something, these uh, babies, that he thought was really important or he wouldn't have been upset over it. And then he says to the disciples two things. Let them come and stop hindering them. So one is kind of a passive thing, but another is more um, active. It's like, get out of the way. And then he tells them why. Because of such is the kingdom of God. This has a spiritual heavenly purpose of coming to Jesus. Even infants, as Luke says, even infants. The Jewish understanding of infants, that they were already in the covenant, and they were not of the age of reason, and so that was in the disciples' thinking, I believe. And so that's why the stoppage. But Jesus puts a halt to that notion. And he says, of such belongs the kingdom of God, in verse 16. Now, these were Jews, Jewish children. We know that because he doesn't say otherwise. It's always assumed he's among the Jews, and the people are Jews unless he identifies them as being something else, like the Syro-Phoenician woman and so on, Samaritans. 
So these were Jews, but when he says this, of such, it opens it up to all children, right? Jews and Gentile alike. But it's not because they are children. It's not that they're innocent or anything, because we know we have original sin, so nobody is innocent. But it's because they are receptive in verse 17. And that's true not only of children, but also of adults. So he opened this wide up when he says, whoever, that's all people of all ages, does not receive the kingdom like a child will not enter. And so there he, he opens the doors wide open to all. And so that's, that's an encouraging thing when we think about babies, right? When we're holding babies, that's a good thing. But think of the parallels we have with this event and our sacrament of baptism. You know, question 339 of H.U. Sverdrup's explanation of Luther's small catechism is, the question, is the baptism of little children in agreement with Christ's command? And the answer, yes. Christ himself has said, and then he quotes this very passage. And also in John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now Luke, I like Luke, because he refers to these as infants. The other two call them children. And then the big debate is, well, how old are these children? Are they 12, 13, the age of reason, and all that kind of stuff? Jesus, or Luke refers to them as even infants, he says, and uses the same word that he used in Luke 1, 44. Luke 1, 44, Elizabeth's words, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So this is an unborn baby, equates with the same word that Luke uses in this passage. Uh, no doubt that that unborn baby was not of the age of reason, right? So I want to tell about a friend of mine, a Gideon friend of mine. And when we get to Gideon's, we don't talk about the sacraments. We don't talk about, you know, the differences in denominations. We talk about just the things that are the same, like we're all a sinner. Jesus died. He died for us. And Faith in him means we can go to heaven. So we keep it very basic so that way we can work together and we don't get in arguments. But I did overhear this friend of mine say to, to a person, um, now, as you have come to Christ, you should be baptized. Now, you're old enough, you understand what's going on, so you ought to be baptized. You know, we're not talking about babies because, you know, they don't understand what's going on. And so that, that wouldn't be... And I... Didn't want to get in an argument, so I didn't say anything. Now, the same friend went on a trip to India later. And uh, he'd been there before, and he spreads the gospel, and he hears people coming to Christ, and praise God, they do. So he comes back, and he's relating this particular, jo this, uh, particular story. He said, I came up to this woman on the street. She was holding her baby. And so I explained the gospel to her, and right there and then, she came to the Lord he says, and even the baby had a, a smile on his face, a, a peaceful smile. And I thought, I thought you didn't think the babies could understand this. I didn't bring it up. But I remember, you know, I mean, even the baby had a peaceful look on his face and a smile. Babies are very valuable. So Luke, uh, that same word of infants that Luke uses is used in 1 Peter 2, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow into salvation. And in Acts 9, or 7, I'm sorry, Acts 7, 19, he dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. They were talking about Moses. This is a recounting of Moses' time. Uh, and so we all know that Moses was still nursing when he was uh, set off in the basket on the Nile. And so we know that that was an infant, not a child of reason. 
And also in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 14 and 15, As for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So even there, when he's talking to Timothy, he's mentioning the sacred writings, the Holy Bible, as he brought up from childhood. That childhood he's talking about as a baby. So that's the infant part of this. And then there's the physical touch of Jesus. What a touch, you know. That equates, I think, to the physical element of water in baptism. It's a touch. It's something that baby feels. Sometimes they cry. Sometimes they get calm. We've seen everything. But it's the actual water on that baby. And then there's the blessing spoken by Jesus. We talked about this a little bit. It doesn't say it in Luke. It's implied that he would pray for them. But Matthew says and prayed. And so Sverdrup continues, what is baptism is not simply water, but it is water used according to God's command and connected with God's word. You know, those babies that Jesus held, they heard it right from God's mouth. We hear it right from God's word. It's not a response to being saved because in 1, Timothy, or 1 Peter 3 it says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. It's an act, not as removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And in Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. So the children that we talked about in 15 through 17 kind of are like the tax collector. They went home justified. Unassuming humility, unquestioning trustfulness, the very essence of saving faith. Now, those insisting on adult baptism and response to already been made clean is in more to me, could be, I'm not accusing, but it could be like the Pharisee who says, I am not like the deplorables. I fast even more than the standard. I tithe all that I get. And not necessarily, again, I don't want to condemn all, all that, but it can appear to be, now that I am good enough, I am willing to be baptized and I'm going to prove it. You know, too often I think that the wisdom of adulthood tries to overshadow the wisdom of God. Because if we can't figure it out, it must not be right. But as we see in Isaiah 55, that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So maybe if we can't figure it out, it's an act of faith. It's an act of faith. All right, so the catechism lesson is over. I hope you enjoyed it as much as they do on Wednesday night. And you probably did. <clears throat> but God's grace is available to all, young and old. The work of salvation has been completed by Christ on the cross. We must not wait to be right in our eyes, but only acknowledge that we are not right in his eyes. Repent and believe. In Titus 3, it says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ, Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So what are we to do? 2 Timothy 2 again says, for as you can... Or as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
And as, that's for ourselves, but as for others, how about these three? Bring infants. Let the children come. Do not hinder them. How often do we hinder them in some way? I don't think I've ever seen anybody stand at the door and say, you can't come in. I might try that next time I get up here. Um, anyway, that's, that's for a later time now. Um, yeah. But do we do it in some uh, more subtle ways? I guess that's something for self-examination. But do not hinder the little children. You know, surveys done by uh, Barna Research Group indicate that American children ages 5 to 13 have a 32% probability of accepting Christ. Youth or teens aged 14 to 18 have only a 14% of probability of doing so. Unbelieving adults 19 and over have just a 6% probability of becoming Christians. So I'd suggest that this data illustrates the importance of influence, influencing children to follow Christ and embrace Him as Savior and Lord. You know, there really is no neutral because if we're not trying to influence the children to come here, Satan is certainly endeavoring to influence the children to stay away and do things in the world, things that are more fulfilling to myself. I like to do. I'll never have this chance to do it again. This, that fish may never bite again. This is my only chance. And maybe even a birdie on the golf course. But that's wildlife. Anyway, so what is there about us? What else? You know, and we see, pretty soon we're going to pray for the cradle roll, which I'm happy to do that. And I think about them, but at the end of every baptism, there's the charge to the congregation. That's us. That's the disciples. We're all disciples of Christ, right? Jesus' disciples. It says, you are witnesses that these have been baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you are also to remember them before God in your prayers and to make certain as far as possible that they are brought up in the faith and fear of God so that they may abide in Christ from this day forward, even as now through baptism they have been grafted into him. You know, I, I may have dispelled a thought of yours about the scene. This was done in a house, not in the pasture or somewhere outside. But here's another thing that I just recognized. It doesn't say that the parents were bringing the little children. It says they, the people. It does not narrow it down to parents. So as an older parent, I did bring my children here. But does that say, okay, you're off the hook? Not according to the charge of the congregation. We can all bring children here, right? Bring their parents too if you're not one of them. So that's our, that's our charge to the congregation. So I just pray that we have maybe looked at this in a little different way. That it's not just about what the disciples did, but our responsibility to not hinder them, to bring even them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, not that we are not like others, but that in spite of our sinfulness and shortcomings, you came to die for us, taking our punishment to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Keep us close to you as we are drawn to your sacred word. Make our witness strong and help us, Lord, to bring others, even infants, to you. Prevent us from hindering anyone from receiving the kingdom of God. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
Let's continue with Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King. Offering will now be received.
join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have so bountifully bestowed your grace upon us, that you have bountifully bestowed upon us the many physical uh, blessings as well. To those, for those things we owe you, thanks. We pray, Lord, for those who are in need, for our shut-ins, Juanita and Joanne, and for those in need of healing, Gordon, Marcia, Rick, and Logan, Bob, and Tim, and Randy, and Norm, Wendell, Dennis, Robert, Diane, Gunner, Casey, Michael, and Ty, Blake, Delbert, and Leslie. Lord, we know that you have worked healing in many of these people's bodies already, and so we thank you for that, and we praise you for, for your grace and your power. But those who have uh, some healing remaining, we just pray that you would put your hand upon them, that they would feel your touch, feel your peace that um, only you can give, that your presence would be felt. And we pray for those on the cradle roll, those who have been baptized and have opportunity to grow. We pray for Willa and Braxton and Lane and Kennedy and Elena and Madeline and Joanna. Lord, we just pray for each one of these children and for those uh, that are charged with caring for them. We thank you, Lord, that they are diligent in their, their physical care. And we pray, Lord, that you would encourage each one of them to also be cognizant of their need for spiritual care, that they may grow day by day as they learn and hear of you. We pray for the church council. Give them your wisdom, Lord, that they may lead us in this time. And for Tracy and Bob, Craig, Corey, and Stephen, and also for the call committee, Warren, Nita, Amy, Cole, Carol, and Stuart, we pray that you would uh, lead them, open their eyes and their hearts, their minds to the person that you have in, in mind and also pray for that person that perhaps this isn't quite the time, but that is uh, your, your will would work in his mind and his heart to be open to a call and that the two will be matched up. In the meantime, we pray for our congregation that we may grow during this time of need. We pray for our, our, our nation, our government, upcoming elections, that your hand would be upon that. We know, Lord, that no one is in position without uh, you putting them there. We pray for world leaders and those in authority and those in the U.S. military and their families, keep them safe. And also safety for the farmers and good weather that the harvest may be um, complete. We pray all those things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the benediction in the final song. From number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.